Hello everyone. Thank you for joining the first ever Advice Health webinar on ER upcoding. I'm your host today, Brittany Heard, and our speakers are Melissa Jewett and Rebecca Evans. To share a little bit about them, Melissa and Rebecca are both Advice Health medical auditors. Both of them are certified professional coders with AAPC, and Melissa is a QA specialist. Today, they will be focusing on upcoding and fraud in the ER. Melissa will start off by going over today's agenda and continue by outlining the main causes of upcoding in the emergency room. At the end of the presentation, we'll also have time for Q&A. A few housekeeping items. If you have questions throughout the webinar, be sure to write them down or write them in the text box and send them to all organizers, and I'll make sure Melissa and Rebecca have time to answer them at the end of their presentation. I'll now turn it over to Melissa, who's going to go over the agenda. Good afternoon. Okay, today we're going to go over um, some statistics regarding the ER upcoding and trends that we found, OIG targets, identifying these trends, provider perspectives, the EH, EHR rule, examples, red flag, OIG recommendations, and as well, we're going to end the session with a Q&A. Brittany, um, Brittany gave us a great introduction already. Um, myself, I have over 15 years of experience in coding and billing. Um, I'm a certified professional coder, and I am a certified professional medical auditor as well. Hello, this is Becky. Um, similar to Melissa, my background is for over 14 years of experience in the medical field in coding and auditing, um, you know, utilizing a variety of different audit tools, but going by the standard um, 95 and 97 E&M documentation guidelines and um, the payer-specific directives. So Melissa and I both share a similar background in the area, and um, we've been doing this for a long time, so we're excited to be able to share this with you today. Okay, so what we're going to get started with here is um, the improper billing practices, some of some of the reasons that we're looking at the ER upcoding today, um, we're looking at these two major contributing factors, improper billing practices, um, and then electronic health records. So Melissa is going to go into a little more detail about what exactly we're talking about here. Sure, and I'm sure that we have a number of different backgrounds with the people that are attending today, whether you are in an auditing role, or you've previously worked in a medical practice and have had some billing experience or coding experience. And so typically when we see improper billing practices, we've all heard, whether you've heard it from the provider after an audit or from the biller in the office, um, how did this happen? Well, I just didn't know. Um, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to put a modifier on every single claim that I bill. Um, I didn't know that that would get me to get more money in my pocket. Uh, you know, the, the biller just doesn't know how to code. So the biller, the biller does all the coding. The provider may, may offer, I don't do any of my coding. My biller does that. Um, we've also heard many providers state, well, every time I see a patient for hypertension, that's just a level four visit. Or because my specialty, um, I, I'm, you know, fill in the blank, I'm a neurosurgeon or I am whatever specialty, I get higher paid ENMs. So we've all heard these, these excuses for how these improper billing practices occur. Um, in regards to electronic health records, we've also found that people will say, well, my system does the coding. And 
this is just how my template is set up. Every time I use this template, I get a level five. I only have canned templates, and this is what I this is what I paid for. Since the implementation of EHR, my bell curve has risen. Right. So these are some pretty big ones. Um, we can't, of course, see your hands today, but you know. Melissa and I have shared this presentation live with some other um, people that are in the same field that we are, and there were a lot of hands that went up, like pretty much all of them, when we asked, um, you know, have you heard any of these excuses before? I think that it's pretty common for us to hear, you know, all of these different reasons that kind of pass the buck to, you know, somebody else. Okay, so in this slide, we're going to go over the electronic health record promises. So the, a primary focus of healthcare reform is electronic health record utilization. So when we think back to why this is taking place with healthcare reform, we are looking at some of these reasons on the screen. The reasoning behind the government was to lower the cost, to improve the efficiencies make things easier, right? Improve the quality of care. And as far as the improving the quality of care goes, um, you know, we're even talking about here the incentives to implement um, that have prompted many providers to become an EHR user. Along with those promises, we've also been promised continuity of care, eliminating, eliminating the unnecessary and duplicate testing. This is especially interesting in the emergency room. Uh, there has, you know, years ago, prior to the use of EHR, a patient would come to the emergency room, and that doctor had no idea if the patient couldn't tell them what testing they have already had done, what, you know, what was recently done. And so with the implementation of EHR, this was a huge improvement um, for the quality and the continuity of care that can be offered to patients, as well as um, shared information. So there's a number of systems that will share information, and specifically prescription drug management. Again, unless the patient can remember all the medications they're taking prior to EHR in these shared systems, um, the patient may not have remembered what medication they were taking, so that's not safe. The, the, ER, the ER doctor would have been, you know, in a risky position to prescribe medications. And the quality of care. Utilization of quality programs such as NCQA, PQRS, CQMs. These are guidelines that are set to improve care. So next we're taking a look at what are the stats. How many EHR users do we have now? If you look at the screen here, we have um, a visual for you. The studies published in the Journal of Health Affairs found that in 2013, almost 8 in 10, or 78 percent, of office-based physicians reported that they adopted some type of EHR system. So about half of all physicians, 48 percent, had an EHR system with advanced functionalities in 2013 which was a doubling of the adoption rate in 2009. So as you can see here, this is a trend that's continuing to grow upwards. And many providers have been on the side of the sales pitch regarding EHRs. And we found this, just a simple search online, this is a real sales pitch uh, found through Google. Better documentation increases your ROI, higher payments. So it's very um, promising to providers who use an EHR that you are going to just get more money. You're going to get paid more by using an EHR. Yeah, so pretty surprising, right, that this, this ad was just found online. Um, and it's directly telling the provider, you'll get paid more and you'll get paid faster for the same services that you've been providing. Um, our question is, is more documentation the same as better documentation? EHRs have created a new chart and a new record. 
no more wondering what, chicken, what the chicken scratch says. Remember the old adage, not documented, not done? Many auditors are now thinking, documented, was this done? Here are some examples of records, and it's small, but you get the point here. You can see on the left side of the screen there is the handwritten note, which was what was familiar to all of us and standard prior to EHR. And then on the right hand side of the note of the screen is a typed note that is from an EHR system. It's much easier to read, um, but there are issues if you delve in deeper here. Right, so like Melissa said, we, we do understand that it's hard to see this on the screen. It's kind of tiny. So I'm just gonna kind of tell you a little bit about what we have pulled from this documentation to just show you know some of the differences and why we're questioning some of the documentation that we're seeing. So here we're looking at um, again on the left hand side the documentation that's very difficult to read. It's handwritten um, and then on the right um, we've got the typed document. So you can see on the screen we've got the review of systems listed here and then we've also got the exam. So if you can't read it I'm just going to kind of point out the review of systems for skin says no rash and normal. However, on the exam for the skin, it says that there's a draining wound on the cheek, which is a direct conflict with the review, with the review of systems. So very commonly, we find um, this with the EHR record, a canned review of systems and or exam. Now, we, we're not saying that, you know, providers shouldn't use templates or to have canned, you know, areas, but they do need to update whatever the pertinent, you know, response is for the particular patient for that date. So what is the presenting problem and what is going on on that specific date of service? Uh, even more commonly, we see the review of systems and the exam not updated. And this is one of the areas we're going to talk about today is a red flag. This is where we can spot the red flag with the inconsistency of the medical record. Another item produced from EHR is cookie cutter records. And we've noted here on the screen two um, separate records from the same provider, same EHR, and You'll notice, I, we changed the names, redacted, of course, but you'll notice that for Mr. Smith on the left-hand side of the screen and Mr. Wilson on the right-hand side of the screen, that both of these patients on these dates were not feeling poorly, malaise, no fever, no chills, recent weight change, no headache, no neck pain, no stiffness, and it keeps going on and on. So these are definitely cookie-cutter records. And what the auditor needs to do is really look deeply at this to see if there was anything changed or updated that was pertinent to the patient. Okay, so here what we're going to take a look at is the production of an unrecognizable record. So what you're looking at on the screen um, you know, is an actual redacted record that we received for an audit. And some of this highlighting that you see and the writing on it, this is actually how we received the record. So um, we're just going to kind of take a little bit deeper of a look at this and see what you guys think and show you what, what we do when we're auditing this. So this Oftentimes, uh, providers using an EHR system, they, they use a system, they put a lot of money into it, and then this is the kind of um, garbage, should I say, <laughs> that they get. This doesn't look like a note at all that you typically would have um, expected prior to EHR. You'll notice that there is the chief complaint, HPI review of systems, again, chief complaint listed again, and then HPI listed again. Um, all in the top line. And so this top paragraph constitutes a bunch of different areas of the history. And you'll notice that it's all jumbled up. So it's very hard to follow. 
And if this doesn't make sense to the auditor, it might not make sense to the office staff that needs to look at this and provide quality care. Uh, one thing that we noticed when we looked at this, at the review of systems under GU, which is highlighted in yellow by the provider, they noted that the urination is normal. And then down below that, here is another section that is also jumbled up. This is at the very beginning of the note, typically where you would find the history of present illness. And this is actually the plan per diagnosis listed. So you'll notice it says abdominal pain. And then underneath that, we find dysuria. And Cipro was ordered. So this, pain, this patient was having painful urination, and they ordered Cipro, probably because it was a UTI or they suspected a UTI. But you can see that that is in direct conflict with the GU review a system stating urination is normal. Okay. Okay, so on this one, we're looking at a similar note. So this is actually from the same provider, but just to go into more detail about the kind of conflicts that we're seeing. So for this patient, again, we have the chief complaint HPI review of systems listed up at the top. It says asthma, and you can see a little X in front of the years there. So we don't, we don't know how many years the patient has had asthma. We can tell that this is a templated, um, HPI and they're not going into any more detail. They're not even filling in all the information. So again here you can see it's circled no rash and that's listed up in the HPI section. And then the first thing that's listed as the diagnosis with the additional history and plan is a rash nonspecific. So this doesn't make any sense. In the HPI, they're saying no rash, and then the first diagnosis is in fact for a rash. So the um, information here is not matching up. Also, a few um, interesting items that we noticed when we looked at this chart, at, at these um, records, is there are some strange um, defaulted items throughout the records. Typically, when a provider uses an EHR, they will, de they will default some common things, like no fever, no chills. Um, those are typical things you would find. But as you will see, if you, list, if you look under the yellow highlighting where it says eyes, no new blindness. This is quite unusual. <laughs> Um, and that, and this wouldn't, this wasn't specific to the provider specialty, which may have been expected if this was an eye doctor or maybe um, a diabetic care office or something like that. But no, this was just a default templated item that there's no new blindness. Also, uh, the the HPI and the review of systems doesn't pertain at all to the reactive airway disease, which is probably the real reason the patient was there that day. It just was not captured in the HPI. So again, it, you know, as not this entire record is not shown here. We're only showing you the first portion of this record. But um, this record was actually a number of pages long, and the auditor was left trying to decipher what is defaulted and what was actually pertinent to the presenting problem for this patient on that date. So this again demonstrates a record which contains defaulted or templated items with minimal modification and or correction by the provider. So this is some of the stuff that we're looking at today um, when we look at records. Here's another example of more confusion. We found an exam was documented, lungs clear to auscultation, CTA, and then a note underneath that that states, Note in comment section of the physical are intended to override the, the default physical yes. Wheeze throughout no labored breathing. So the, the note comment makes very little sense, but from reading over that, I gather that they mean that they're trying to override the default comment of lungs clear to auscultation with an actual pertinent comment that states that the patient has wheezes throughout 
Um, so if again, if a if a staff member you know picked up this chart quickly and had to look to see if this patient has any sort of breathing trouble, they may just see lungs clear to auscultation and stop there. And you know that would definitely be a quality of care issue. The other really funny thing, and <laughs> we got a good laugh over this when we found this disclaimer. Um, it's not really funny. It's actually kind of sad, but um, sometimes as auditors you get kicks out of these types of things. <laughs> so we came across this disclaimer, and it, in this record it actually noted, please be advised, blank doctor uses an electronic medical record program to document patient care. The printed version of this program is in no way a good reproduction of the actual program. Please refer to the actual program for clearer re representation. Chart not reviewed unless manually signed by the provider. So this is like really a scary comment, this disclaimer. This is actually located in somebody's medical record. So like Melissa said, you know, other staff members, or how about this patient got referred out to another provider? Another medical doctor or provider is going to be looking at this note and trying to make a decision on this patient's care. And what we see in the medical record doesn't make any sense. So I think it's important to, to keep in mind, um, this is somebody's actual medical record. So, you know, would we want this for ourselves? I don't think so. No. This is called CYA, this yeah. disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> cover your backside on that one. <laughs> so EHRs may be the culprit. Here we're looking at EHRs can be blamed for bolstering the documentation, the volumes of records yielding comprehensive history in exams. Some EHRs have tried to master medical decision making, pulling into the note a full problem list and calling it the diagnosis. This tactic is especially interesting when viewing a record that comes from a large health system. Yes, we've seen that example um, from a large health system where a patient uh, goes to multiple doctors within that system and they all share the same EHR under one umbrella. So the, the note that we could be reviewing today for her cardiology appointment may state that um, she has um, issues with her fallopian tubes or cysts on her ovaries, um, something that is a complete different specialty that's just pulling in because the same EHR is used by another um, specialty doctor that the patient happens to visit. So it makes it really difficult, again, to decipher what's going on currently with the patient. and um, what's being addressed at this visit in order to calculate the um, level of code that we're talking about here. The long list tactic. Here's another example of doing the long diagnosis list. Mrs. Smith presents to the urgent care clinic today with a complaint of right hand finger injury. Right hand is examined, index finger shows bruising, swelling, and no other injuries are noted. The diagnosis. Contusion finger hyperlipidemia, chronic fatigue, hypothyroidism, chronic sinusitis. The plan, x-ray, right hand, index finger, rest, and ibuprofen. Yeah, so wow, when we take a look at the diagnosis, it doesn't make sense, right? What was the patient really here for today? A contusion to their finger. So in this instance, you know, we kind of, you can see what we have italicized here, and those things are, are really not going to be counted as far as the me medical decision making goes. The EHR is going to try to include this information if the provider is using you know, the EHR system to do the coding, then it might count these for the medical decision making. But as auditors um, and human beings instead of computers, this is where we need to step in and separate these items from what the patient is actually being seen for today. Again, here's another diagnosis list from an EHR record, and you can see the example of, you know, what's it's repeated over and over again. Uh, the same thing is being said in different ways. For example, bullet number three, shoulder impingement. 
and bullet number four, impingement of the right shoulder. And so this is pulled in as the patient's diagnosis list. So this is another good example, and I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I started to smile when I saw this um, screen come up, because this is something that we see very commonly. Um, and we kind of, you know, joked around about it as we put it in. Not that any of this is a joke, but it's just really surprising a lot of times um, what we do see. So um, what we put in, in our background here is, you know, like the provider is saying this, shoulder joint pain, shoulder impingement, impingement of the right shoulder. Wait, did I already say that? This is all to do with the shoulder, although we've got all of these different bullets that are trying to separate it out um, in different ways. So EHRs are not the only factor that are contributing to this long list of diagnoses found in the assessment and plan. Um, programs which use capitation payments are gauged by the risk adjust adjustments is kind of adding to this trend. So you know, when there are providers that are going by the capitation payment and they, you know, are being paid based on what is the patient there for, um, you know, the risk adjustment is a little bit different than what we're talking about as far as the fee for service evaluation and management services. So for the purpose of risk adjustment, adding the multiple diagnoses to the record should only be applied to the patient's claims for which the capitation payment is expected, is these payments are not based on the E&M code levels as per the documentation guidelines that we're looking at here. I tend to feel a lot of providers don't have that understanding, and they wouldn't. They would send a blanket diagnosis list to a fee-for-service insurance carrier, just as well as they would the capitated plan. Right, because they're using a templated record a lot of times, so. They don't have it um, separated out that way. Right. And here's our little jackpot guy. I love this slide. Uh, so this new breed of documentation is creating a unique problem. Some have referred to this new issue as gaming. Others call it fraud. Template increases the quantity of documentation obtained cloning of medical documentation, and upcoding. Therefore, we have jackpot. <laughs> yeah, so this is what, um, you know, we're seeing part of the EHR, you know, providers using the EHRs. It's creating these additional issues that are going to require us to take a fresh look at the documentation. Um, infusing the documentation guidelines into an EHR sometimes creates the situation for upcoding. So an EHR template could be thought of as a buffet, and here are all the options, right? We go to a buffet and we see all kinds of different stuff, right? We've got the healthy food, we've got the fried food, we've got dessert, we've got basically whatever we want. But um, when we think of the, the EHR template as being a buffet, same thing is when we go to we go out to eat. Do we eat everything at the buffet? No. We have to make, we have to choose what we're going to eat, right? We couldn't possibly eat everything there. So when we think about the EHR template as a buffet, um, what we're saying is maybe it should be looked at a little bit differently as to pick and choose what is most pertinent and what is happening again on this visit in particular. Uh, instead of the provider choosing everything on the buffet here. Exactly. The goal versus reality. New York Times wrote, when the federal government began providing billions of dollars in incentives to push hospitals and physicians to use electronic medical and billing records, the goal was not to improve efficiency in patient safety, but also to reduce health care costs. The goal was not only to improve efficiency, but to reduce health care costs. But in reality, the move to electronic health records may be contributing to billions of dollars in higher costs for Medicare, private insurers, and patients by making it easier for hospitals and physicians to bill more for their services, whether or not they provide additional care. Yeah, wow. So these are some really strong words. And you can see here with a citation and as 
um, Melissa mentioned, this is coming from the New York Times. Um, so this was this article that came out was not very well liked by um, you know a lot of different people, but really it's what we're dealing with at this point in time. So we're going to kind of take a step back. We're going to go back to what were the goals of EHR to begin with. One of the major goals was to decrease the cost, but um, what we're finding is that in reality there's been increased spending. So we're going to continue on here with, with how we can, you know, deal with what is going on currently. So here we have EHR uh, walking the line between ROI and fraud, right? So we're looking at return on investment versus fraud. We, we want the provider to get the money that they deserve, right? Whatever is documented, we want to give them credit for it. But we also want to hold them to that standard that, you know, they're only documenting what they're actually doing with the visit in the patient at that time. So here we're looking at medical professionals have billed at higher levels, higher rates, and collected billions of dollars in questionable fees after switching to EHRs. And a key finding, doctors and hospitals moved to better paying codes in recent years. And the trend in part demonstrates upcoding. Upcoding the practice of charging more um, for extensive services and costly services than that were actually delivered. So again, this was the Center for Public Integrity, and this was published back in 2012 as the result of a 21-month study. Yeah, so that EHR, um, widespread implementation at EHR had only just begun at at the start of this um, study here and already billions of dollars had been collected from the providers that were switching to EHR so can you even imagine we are what six seven eight years into the EHR implementation now um, EHR has been widespread implemented at this point so there is a lot of money that has been spent and that is definitely questionable yeah crazy Okay, so here we have government awareness of the EHR gaming. In 2012, Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of the DOH and Human Services, and Attorney General Eric Holder warned hospitals not to use EHRs to illegally boost their Medicare payments. In a letter to hospital trade associations, they wrote, however, there are troubling indications that some providers are using this technology to game the system possibly to obtain payments to which they are not entitled. They wrote, false documentation of care is not just bad patient care, it's illegal. So some really important, um, you know, ideas really to keep in mind here is that, yes, it is illegal, and when we look at it as auditors, that's a lot of what we're seeing, but this, this quote really goes back to you know, it's really terrible patient care, too, which is really something that we should all be thinking about as well. Another point, too, from this, uh, and stating that, you know, just it's not only bad patient care, but it's illegal. We've found that um, different carriers and different plans handle these types of issues with templating and defaulting and um, all of that differently and I think that there is a lack of um, definition in you know the documentation guidelines they don't speak to this because the guidelines were written prior to the implementation of EHR but it's important to know it is illegal when we find these inconsistencies in the chart it you do you should question the medical integrity of the documentation The OIG notes a decline in low-level ER visits and an incline of high-level ER visits over the last 10 years. The most aggressive billing patterns cost Medicare over $100 million in 2010 alone, of which ER visits was one of the top five highest specialties. Wow, so that's pretty crazy, right? And when you look at the screen, you can really um, get a good visual here when you're looking at it. Uh, each year, high-level ER visits have increased 
and low-level ER visits have decreased. So you can kind of take a look there. Um, look at the 99281s, right? I mean, there wasn't very many to begin with, but you can see as it progresses to the right there with the years, it's on an it's on a, a decline there. Same thing with the 99282s. We're looking at a decline. Same with the 99283s. But then when we take a look at the 99284s, it looks like that's kind of staying the same. Wow. Look at the 99285. So everything else that declined, it's like they got pulled away from those buckets and they all went into the 99285s, the high level ER visits. Pretty surprising. That is amazing. I mean, that is really scary. Prior to EHR implementation, I mean, these dates, these timeline dates really reflect EHR implementation timelines. And a visit that was warranted as a level one, lowest level, has now dumped into the highest level code. Scary. Crazy. So, wow, look at these, right? Look at these little signs here. How can an auditor see through the EHR documentation? So when you do have the large amounts of documentation, how can the auditor see through the fluff and accurately score the evaluation and management visit? Many of you are thinking, I know where this is going, right? Medical necessity. Look at these like danger signs here. Caution, danger, medical necessity. <clears throat> Excuse me, not something that we tend to like to talk about. As auditors, we sift through volumes, volumes of overly documented records. Some neatly, some are seriously disorganized. We often are frustrated with the final audit result, level fours and fives. The documentation was there. The concern is the high level of service wasn't really warranted, but the documentation supports it. So what can you do? What options do we have? Is it education? Well, education is, is part of the answer, yes. Uh, do, but we have some other ideas. We do. And one more thing about medical necessity is uh, some, some plans and some states will um, support a medical necessity audit, completely stand behind it, and that's fine. And so that would be very appropriate to apply medical necessity rules to these issues that we've been discussing. But we also have encountered many plans and many states that do not support a medical necessity denial. They do not want to be in the position of questioning the doctor's judgment. Um, when it push comes to shove, when they're you know in a in a courtroom situation, they do not want to be questioning the provider. So right. So we're going to show you where we're going with this. Um, you know when you when you don't like to see the medical necessity, kind of like the screen now, um, you know, now it's time to check your phone, close your eyes, and check out. Because as we get, begin to talk about medical necessity, we get a little bit on edge, right? Nobody wants to hear, for the most part, you know, we're going by only medical necessity. So you might be thinking that that's where we're going, and we don't like to do medical necessity audits. So that's not where we're going to go. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so instead, let's get started. So we're talking about the e &M components here. Uh, clear the thought of medical necessity from your mind. We'll go back to the foundation of e &M coding. So determining the level of e &M service requires consideration of the key components. So we're looking at history, exam, and medical decision making. We do realize that most of you that are here today with us are probably quite familiar with these areas and a lot of what we're going to talk about. So we're not going to go into, you know, terrible detail about this. We're going to kind of stick with um, what coders and auditors would be looking at as far as determining the level of e &M service. History. History is comprised of the chief complaint history of present illness, past family social history, and the review of systems. One thing that we, know, we noted, and this would be a red flag area to look for when you're looking at the records, is who can, who can document or who can obtain this information? And we found that the chief complaint, the review of systems, 
past family social history can be obtained by ancillary staff. But we found multiple guidelines, um, industry guidelines, that state the provider must document the HPI. So you may not find that in the record. Uh, it may be hard to identify who's actually documenting that portion, but occasionally you will. And actually, EHRs um, sometimes tip the auditor off to this because each person who documents has their own login. And so at the end of the notation, it may say entered by um, so-and-so, and it may just list their initials. And you can notice that that would be different from the provider's login and initials. Right. So we're going to take even a little bit further of a look into this. Um, history complicated by the EHR. So in, in this instance, we're looking at um, triage notes. Ancillary staff obtains the triage note. The note is entered into the EHR. Um, autofills HPI. The EHR functionality autofills the HPI, importing from the triage note. And then the provider review. Provider reviews and signs the record. Um, is this an appropriate process? Sure. And this definitely happens in the ER with the triage uh, or urgent care centers where um, staff, whether it's the nurse or the medical assistant or a medical receptionist, they triage the patient and they gather that information. The staff often will populate the triage into the computer and when it goes into the EHR, do you know what happens next? So is it is it filling in, auto-filling, that this is now the provider's record that the staff obtained? Right. We don't know. We don't know who obtained the information and, and who it's been, um, you know, looked at by. Is it the provider? Did the provider look at that? Um, you know, while the time-saving efficiencies are a huge benefit of using the EHRs, such as to auto-fill and pull forward, this feature must be used judicially. Who can obtain the HPI? Um, I spoke previously about the different industry standards that we found that state the HPI must be documented by the provider or the physician. And here are three of those that we found. Medicare Part B News states the HPI must be obtained by the physician during the E&M service. Reviewing this information obtained by an ancillary employee and writing a declarative sentence does not suffice for obtaining the history of present illness. Palmetto GBA, clarified by CMS, states only the physician or NPP who is conducting the E&M visit can perform the history of present illness. This is physician work and cannot be relegated to ancillary staff, as well as the CPT assistant. And in the CPT assistant, each HPI element had language stating the, phys the physician should get or the clinician should have an understanding as to. So here we're looking at, again, three respected sources and they're all agreeing that the HPI must be obtained by the provider, um, the physician, or clinician. So just this is just a quick one here. The exam focus is determined by the patient's history. Well, first, the nature of the presenting problem, the patient's history, and the clinical judgment. Here we have exam EHR pitfalls. So we have template issues. What are some of the template issues that we see? Gender and age discrepancies and default a response for an area possibly not examined. So let me just give you like a quick, um, a quick one that we actually saw recently and we discussed, you know, would you give credit for this? And of course we did not give credit for it. But we recently saw some records in which for the GU system and exam, uh, the provider simply had written out on the template male or female. And he would simply circle, was it a male or a female? Now, obviously, we all know if, if he really did do an exam, if he or she did do an exam, then there would be some kind of additional information listed there. Um, whether the patient was male or female is not substantial 
to give credit for exam in that area. So that's just a quick example of something that we've seen recently. As far as cloning concerns, the EHR may pull information into the exam that is in direct conflict with the presenting problem. So remember that couple um, of charts that we already looked at, right? There was some cloning concerns there and or some templating issues there where there was a, a direct conflict in between what the patient presented for and then other history areas. And the same exact thing happens with exam. And then the final one that we've got here is a human error. Um, if someone is unfamiliar with the EHR, transitions from mouth to paper to EHR. Um, in some offices, you know, we're seeing scribes and things of that nature. So if it's not that actual person who's doing it and putting it into the EHR, then, you know, we, we might see more discrepancy there. Yes, we've, we've noticed uh, using templates as a guide is a helpful tool, but this is often a stumbling block for many providers looking to document properly. Oftentimes, m providers will state, I just didn't understand the EHR. Um, I wasn't trained on it. I don't know where to find what I need to find to document properly. Additionally, we found that the errors in the record come from a lack of understanding of the system. Um, on the flip side, though, auditors have seen great many records in which it appears that the provider knows all too well how to document in the EHR, thereby maximizing its efficiencies and capitalizing therewith. Okay, so now we're just going to take a little bit of a dive into the medical decision making. So we've looked at history, we've looked at exam, and now we're going to look at medical decision making. So here we're just looking at basically a little snippet of the CPT manual and the evaluation and management guidelines. And this is just table one, complexity of the medical decision making. So here you can just see when we're scoring the medical decision making, what areas are included. We've got the number of diagnoses or management options, the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed, and the risk of complication and or morbidity or mortality. And that's going to give us our overall level of medical decision making. So now we're going to go ahead and take a little bit closer of a look into the descriptors that are found here. Letter A, number of diagnosis or treatment options. Again, back to the reference of the long list of diagnosis, this would be the number of diagnosis or treatment options that were addressed at this visit. And B, the amount and or complexity of data reviewed. This would be um, items that are credited when the provider orders or reviews test results, um, makes decisions on the treatment, you know, the treatment plan. Right, so here we're just really taking a look at the first portion, the two first items of the medical decision making. And this is just um, an audit tool to kind of show you, again, what points are associated with these things. And like Melissa said, when we are talking about things like the long list of diagnoses, um, that's why we were saying with the one with a finger contusion earlier on, we're not going to give credit for that patient's hypertension and all these other things that were not addressed at all during the visit. We're only going to give credit for the things that were actually um, touched upon during that visit. And letter C, the risks of complications, morbidity, and mortality. Here's the table of risk. Right, so again, this is just continuing on um, with an audit tool to kind of give an overview of, of what we're talking about. Putting it all together, A, B, and C. The number of diagnosis or management options, along with the amount or of complex data, as well as the overall risk. Right, so we're going to put the puzzle together, and what are we going to come up with? Medical decision-making 
in a new light. So look at our little light bulb guy there. It's pretty exciting when we when we first started, you know, taking all these things into consideration that we do on a normal basis as we audit charts. So what if medical decision making was used as a controlling or key component or overarching criteria for code level determination? How is the medical decision making method different from medical necessity? As demonstrated throughout the presentation, we can all agree that history and exam components are typically where you will find the comprehensive EHR documentation. It is difficult for EHRs to pump up the MDM. As noted earlier, there are attempts that are made at providing long lists of diagnosis to bolster the MDM. Auditors can rely on client-defined policy, which guides that credit is given only for the diagnosis that is managed at the time of service, as per the documentation. So is it fair to say that with this new breed of charts, medical decision making may be the one area of the record that still does not lie? How is medical decision making different from medical necessity? Using the medical decision making method, you are not in a position of questioning or doubting the necessity of the service provided. Instead, the code level is assigned in direct relationship to the level scored as medical decision making. Code assignment is calculated based on the MDM that is documented. Think of it as a filter. Right, so simply we are saying, provider, what did you see the patient for and what did you do? And our answer is going to be the medical decision making. Um, is this the answer for every audit? Um, each audit has its unique issues and we have successfully utilized this tool to defend against the ever-increasing EHR issues. So um, it might not be the answer for every audit, but it is an answer for a lot of audits in which we are seeing this um, cut and paste kind of thing, the templated issue, um, the, the long list of diagnoses, and where we're trying to decipher uh, you know, what was actually reviewed today and what happened today. One thing that is um, another point of how they are different, how is MDM and medical necessity different? Because you might be thinking, well, to calculate medical necessity, we go through these same or similar steps considering the complexity of the presenting problem and, and what was documented as a treatment plan. Yes, they are similar steps. But outlined in the documentation guidelines, we have this calculation formula, so to speak, of MDM, medical decision making. And this is concrete. This is the, form, the format that we are supposed to use to figure out the level of MDM, where with medical necessity, you get more into a judgmental situation that your clinician, your your nurse RN auditor feels that clinically this was not medically necessary or your peer-to-peer -peer review your physician feels this was not medically necessary. So uh, the difference here is really that MDM is not as much judgmental. It still is going based on what is documented and addressed at that visit that day. Right. So we're going to score these items. So that makes it a little bit easier because we're not using um, you know subjective data here and we're not the provider so we're not doing the objective portion of the note either we're really looking at what is documented instead of um, trying to make a call on the medical necessity so medical decision making controlling key component when looking at the record um, it's three steps First, you're going to look at the chief complaint and or presenting problem. What is the patient here for? Then you're going to skip to the assessment and plan. What is the diagnosis that is addressed at this visit? And third, what is the treatment plan or management options? These items put together are going to equal your medical decision making. So when we say to skip to the assessment and plan, we of course do not mean to not score you know, the rest of the history and exam, you are still going to score all of those areas. We're just saying, let's maybe first take a look at what is the medical decision making going to be? Because we feel that as we've reviewed here today, 
a lot of times you're going to find with EHRs that you're going to have a comprehensive history and exam portion of the note. So really, this is what is going to come into play for the level of service that you should be coming to. Regarding the nature of the presenting problem, in Medicare Carrier Manual, Section 30.6.1a, Medicare states, it would not be medically necessary or appropriate to bill a higher level of evaluation and management service when a lower level of service is warranted. The volume of documentation should not be the primary influence upon which a specific level of service is billed. Documentation should support the level of service reported. Wow, right? So the level of MDM is not based on volume, but it's based on the presenting problem and what services the patient received on that given date of service. And again, this guideline does speak to medical necessity. Um, CMS does um, tend to stand behind medical necessity. But then at the state level with um, state Medicaid plans, sometimes that is not the case. So you can pull from this, the volume of documentation should not be the primary influence upon which a specific level of service is billed. Okay, so here we have some more excerpts from Medicare's Evaluation and Management Services Guide. While documentation of the chief complaint is required for all levels, the extent of information gathered for the remaining elements related to the patient's history is dependent upon clinical judgment and the nature of the presenting problem. And then a second one here. An examination may involve several organ systems or a single organ system. The type and extent of the examination performed is based upon clinical judgment, the patient's history, and nature of the presenting problems. Again, here, the medical decision making is scored based on what is documented, not questioning the clinician's judgment. So does this work, medical decision making? The results are in. Audits performed utilizing MDM as the controlling key component for COVA level determination clearly does demonstrate upcoding practices. Large amount of claim payments are being recouped utilizing this method. Okay, so we're going to start looking at some examples here. Um, audit finding example for medical decision making. An outpatient urgent care clinic is what we're looking at here. The audit focus was high levels, four and five emergency visits. Um, this audit was performed utilizing medical decision making as the overarching criteria for the code level determination. Some of the trends that were identified here, AHR documented notes, which consistently yielded comprehensive history and exam levels, despite the chief complaint or diagnosis and severity. So with that being said, what we were really looking at was a whole lot of upcoding. Um, Melissa, do you want to talk about the audit results? I sure. think you're the bigger part of this one. Yes. Uh, we found a large number of claims were downcoded, one to three levels of service. And this was a, a smaller uh, type audit, but even so, the recoupment extrapolated was still 400000 The provider, when prior you know, to the overpayment, he had his appeal right. And the provider actually was an interesting situation because the provider is an emergency room physician who works in a hospital. And he opened his own urgent care clinic and outpatient facility. And so the, from his experience with coding and ER, he applied the hospital rules to his outpatient clinic. So when he made an appeal to these, these claims, he was um, referencing the acuity of care system uh, which is if a patient, say, for example, comes in with a headache, in the ER, the acuity level may be assigned high because it could be for it could be um, like a stroke or it could be an aneurysm, and they just don't know. And, and so in the emergency room facility, they use that acuity level to determine the level of service. 
um, on a side note too, they also use the same ER CPT codes for billing, but they are not assigned based on history exam and medical decision making levels. They are assigned based on hospital policy and um, overhead and acuity levels again. So um, it was kind of interesting in this where the provider being um, a hospital ER physician, he applied that logic to the outpatient professional claims. Right, so these patients coming in with a headache um, were maybe actually coming in with just a regular headache uh, and, and really not something of such high risk as the provider was used to. So continuing on um, with the audit findings here, interesting, interestingly, the urgent care center, um, well, actually, this is the information that Melissa just talked about, so I'm not going to go into huge detail with that. Yes. It, again, it's the same thing. Um, ER coding is very different than outpatient ER coding, despite using the same set of codes. All right, so now we're going to get into some of the fun stuff, uh, examples and red flags. So here we have a chief complaint of rectal bleeding. Again, we do understand that this, is, this might be a little bit difficult to read on your screen. Um, the final diagnosis here is hemorrhoid. The provider billed a 99284. So what we're looking at is um, where it says diagnostic impression, it says right red blood per rectum and then period hemorrhoid. You can see over to the right, if you can see over to the right, again, the code billed was a 99284. That doesn't really make sense, right? So the, the medical decision making should, should be the overarching criteria for the E&M level of service here. Correct. And when we, we went through this full record, and this is a snippet of the record, but when going through the entire record and scoring out the history exam and medical decision making, we then took a look at the diagnosis, um, which is a new problem with no additional workup. And then we also looked at the table of risk. The presenting problem was an acute uncomplicated illness or injury, which has a low level assignment. And the overall medical decision making level was low. Utilizing MDM as an overarching criteria, we found that the code level supported was 99282, two code levels lower than what the provider had billed. Okay. So let's take a look at this next next example. So again, I did just see the, the question pop up if, if you guys are going to get the slides. And I did see Brittany respond that she did include the slides. So you will get a copy of this. And then if you can, you know, take a moment to open, up on, open it up on your computer screen so that you can maybe look at um, the records a little bit better as well. But until you're able to do that, we're, we're going to just kind of go through and try to indicate what is there on the screen, even though it might be small. So in this example, we have a chief complaint of constipation, and you can see the treatment. Um, the issue resolved in the ER with water intake. Again, here over to the right, the provider did bill a 99284 on this. So that's a pretty high level of service. Um, the patient presented with abdominal pain, constipation, and had a past history of constipation. And the emergency department course was completed, or complete resolution, with the water intake while in the ED. So Melissa, do you mind walking through again the points here and, sure. and how we scored this? Sure. So we took a look at the chief complaint and the HPI, and we found the patient had abdominal pain, constipation. Uh, we scored a new problem with workup, four points, which was high. And the, the provider ordered an x-ray in the ER. He ordered or reviewed it, or both, as well as labs were ordered and reviewed. So one point was given for each of those items, a total of two. The amount and complexity of data was low or limited. 
The presenting problem is chronic with exacerbation because of the history of constipation. Um, it was a chronic with exacerbation, which is moderate. And the management options, fluids, minimal. So the code level assigned overall came out to 99283. You can see that using medical decision making as the key factor here, it brought it down from a level four to a level three. So here, when we're looking at the emergency department visits, the 99281 through the 99285, um, we are looking at the required three key components. You can see here we have um, bold print here for the medical decision-making portion. So for me as far as the medical decision-making goes, we have straightforward for a level one, low complexity for a level two, and for a level three and four, we have moderate complexity. So it could be a three or it could be a four, kind of a gray area that we're going to look at. And then for the 99285, it has to be uh, medical decision-making of high complexity. In regards to the gray area, my the best advice I could offer is that you're going to be using the medical decision making as one of the key components. So in a in a code that requires two out of the three key components, the medical decision making would be required. Then you want to look to either the history or exam. And if you cannot figure out um, what's defaulted and what is really pertinent to that visit, that may be a straight out denial of the claim, being that the medical integrity is questioned. Um, but if you can identify the history or ex exam being um, appropriate, then you would use one of those two areas to guide you for the level. Right, so don't forget that you do still have to keep take into consideration that history and examination portions. Okay, so now really we're getting towards the end of the presentation, so we're going to take a look at some of these. I think that they're a little bit bigger, so if you could just take a quick moment to kind of look through the record, and then what we're going to do is just go down through and let you know, um, you know, how we looked at these and, and what score we gave. In this record, we have a long list of active problems, um, abdominal pain, anemia, BCC, SCC, personal history, cardiac pacemaker, chest discomfort, um, cystocele, dizziness, gastritis, GERD, hemorrhoids, hiatal hernia, hypertension, and it keeps going on and on and on. The chief complaint for the visit is established patient pessary cleaning. Patient is here today with daughter for pessary cleaning before leaving to go north for the summer. Still reports frequent urination, however, it has improved since pes pessary use. Overall, feeling well, denies vaginal discharge or uh, ovid erosion. No bleeding. Her daughter, who has been helping her with her pessary cleaning every four to six weeks, reports no problems. Patient complains of pessary shifting inside, which can be uncomfortable. No other gynecological complaints. Assessment, cystocele, rectocele, vaginal discharge, plan, cystocele, lidocaine, and other follow-up. Okay, so what we're looking at here, for A, we would be looking at a new problem um, for the patient. So in this instance, we gave three points, and then for B, none, there's no additional data to be reviewed, and for C, we came out with moderate uh, medical decision making, or I'm sorry, moderate risk due to the prescription management. So this ended up coming out to um, be moderate medical decision making. And here is another sample example using um, MDM. 
the active problems, again, another long list. You'll notice in this one, um, it appears this is a OBGYN uh, practice specialty, and you'll find other, other items listed amongst this list. Um, neoplasm of the breast, constipation, hypertension, hemorrhoids, hyperlipidemia, migraine headache, ovarian cyst, personal history of colon polyps. And that's fine if that is just a problem list. It's appropriate to have that listed there. Um, an entire active problems list. Um, and patient is here today for ultrasound, secondary to mild, moderate, lower pelvic pain, more to the left than the right. She states that the pain was gradual and is now constant and worsening. She describes the pain, the pelvic pain is a dull, nagging feeling. She uses Nucinta for back pain and states that it's also helpful with pelvic pain. She cannot identify any aggravating factors. Associated signs symptoms include constipation, chronic opioid induced, and bloating. She has a history of ovarian cysts. Last transvaginal ultrasound was on 102514 with evidence of one. Evidence of one oh assist. <laughs> <laughs> Newly diagnosed breast cancer starts radiation therapy this week. It's very kind of confusing reading through that, what the point of this visit is. If it's her pelvic pain or if she's following with this provider regarding her breast cancer, it's a little difficult to identify there. Right. So for this medical decision making, basically what we did was we went through, we found two stable problems, which is going to equal low medical decision making, even with the suggestion of surgery. So what we looked at was for A or the amount and or complexity, or I'm sorry, the number of diagnoses, we have um, low for self-limited or minor times two problems. Then for B, we have B, which is the amount and or complexity of data. We have the independent review of image, tracing, or specimen for two points. And then for C, the risk of complication None. The provider um, does mention newly diagnosed breast cancer and radiation therapy this week, but that was diagnosed um, by another provider, and this provider is just stating um, that this was also included here. But really what the patient is here for is that pelvic pain. So for this one, um, I believe, did we get moderate? I believe it was moderate. So this one we came up with moderate um, mm, or low medical decision making. Low. Yeah, that I could go back to low. It low, could be low. low. None. Yep. Okay, so you can kind of get the idea as we go through these. So. Um, We'll do this last one, and then we're going to kind of skip over the next one. You will have it to review on, on your slides and your handout there that Brittany is going to send through. But the sample number three here we're looking at, again, let's look at this long list of active problems that the provider has listed here. I'm going to kind of even skip over that, and we're going to look at what's the patient here for. So the chief complaint... Um, this is a new patient referred by Dr. Yaki, review CT of the pelvis, and an ovarian mass. So here's, you know, that's, that's the chief complaint for this patient and the assessment adnexal mass. So the exam, CT of the pelvis, the pelvis post contrast. I'm trying to just read this for you. Clinical information, 64-year-old with question post-void residual with the urinary bladder on a recent ultrasound of the kidneys and of the urinary bladder. So there was a comparison, an ultrasound of the kidneys and urinary bladder from 4615. And then we are looking at the plan. Um, there's some female genital symptoms some labs listed there. In the other section, follow-up, 10 to 14 days, and more labs being ordered. So the, the actual diagnosis, it looks like, is adnexal mass. 
number one, they reviewed the CT findings with patient. Number two, they're going to draw tumor markers. And number three, expectant management pending blood work regarding the removal of the mass. So here um, we're going to look at, this is a new problem with additional workup. So that's going to be given four points. Two points for data reviewed and orders that were completed, the CT scan and labs. And the treatment option is going to be major surgery with no risk factors identified. You can see that the provider mentioned surgery, but he didn't mention or she didn't mention the risk factors to the patient. So this is actually going to come out to medical decision making of a moderate complexity here. Okay. So this concludes our presentation and we can turn this over for um, Q&A to begin. Yes, thank you Melissa and Rebecca for that presentation. Um, we're now going to go over some questions. If you have any questions, please send, um, send them to all organizers now. Um, here is a question we just received. Um, Melissa and Becky, have you noticed the trend of upcoding to level five visits? Is this change appropriate? Yes, we clearly have seen this change of um, many codes have become a level five. And is it appropriate? Have, have patients become sicker over the last few years? Um, is the type of service the provider is providing, is it more detailed, more comprehensive than it was in the past? I would say, generally speaking, no, um, it, it's, not, it's not always appropriate. Right, it's not always appropriate. And unfortunately, I mean, I shouldn't even say unfortunately, but as you could see from the one slide that we looked at, there's been a, a really large increase on level fives that are being billed. And um, we're not seeing, you know, patients that are sicker. We're seeing the same types of, um, you know, reviews that are being done for patients, but we're seeing a higher level being filled. So that's what's concerning. Okay, great. Here's another question for both of you. Um, what has led to this change? Well, we definitely feel that EHRs have led to the change and the increased documentation, the volumes of documentation. Right. You know, a lot of times um, as auditors, I think that we do still see a lot of handwritten um, documents, and we also see a lot of templates being used. But um, what we're finding as far as the levels of service being supported as far as an audit goes, um, we are seeing more and more of those EHRs being used and the templates that include all of this data that doesn't always pertain to the visit at hand. Okay, perfect. Um, one other question. Can you share some audit tactics to guard against these new trends? Sure. Just as we um, stated that using medical decision making as a guide um, it, it could be used as just a sample. So if you want to trend a provider, if you have suspicion for upcoding or, or whatever for this provider, you could do a small sample of their records and just do like how we suggested, where you look at the chief complaint and the presenting problem and then you skip down to the assessment and plan. And that would be a great way to eyeball it and get a gauge for if further audit um, in-depth needs to happen here. Yeah, I think that that's a great response, Melissa. Um, I think that that's a great idea as far as taking a sample at first and, and going through um, each of these items and really seeing what kind of difference would that make in the coding. Perfect, thank you. Um, it looks like those are all the questions that we have for now. If anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to Melissa and Rebecca.
Um, and thank you to everyone again for attending today's webinar on, e on ER upcoding. You will be receiving an email shortly with the recording of today's webinar along with your AAPC CEU certification for the one and a half CEUs along with an evaluation to complete. We'd really appreciate everyone's feedback for this. Um, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.